Okay, so next presentation is Dr. Phoebe Gordon. Uh, she will talk about how will a changing climate affect orchard crops. So it's so I, what I discussed about was broader changes, and and then now we'll drill down into more specific to orchard crops. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so thanks for the introduction. Um, so I guess I'm gonna. Uh, I guess I use uh, changing climate, but mostly I'm going to be talking about temperature um, and how that can change uh, chill. Um, and I'll also use a case study about uh, warmer temperatures during bloom periods uh, and prunes. So um, just kind of like a brief overview about why we care about temperatures in general. Um, uh, there are temperature ranges that plants are um, basically evolved to deal with. Um, plants like to have, you know, kind of ideal temperatures just like we do. Um, I think most plants would be happy to, you know, be growing at 70 to 80 degree, degree weather um, uh, and not too much sunlight. But basically, you know, obviously that doesn't happen. You know, we have plants that are growing in the desert. We also have plants growing in cold climates where it freezes and where, um, you know, tender plant tissues that will photosynthesize um, will die. Uh, if, they, if they freeze. And so plants will actually have evolved mechanisms for dealing with this. Um, uh, you know, heat shock proteins can help proteins stay in shape during hot, uh, hot climates and hot temperatures. And um, plants can manipulate their internal processors to uh, withstand freezing temperatures as well. But these do have um, some costs. So. Um, there's a particular type of photosynthesis that uh, plants that grow in hot and dry climates use called CAM photosynthesis. Um, and so it allows them to photosynthesize efficiently in lower, um, lower uh, water environments, but they do have a uh, slow growth as the byproduct, so cacti, for instance. Um, and uh, for plants that grow in cold climates that freeze, um, you know, uh, seeds, uh, uh, and overwintering is a seed form, so annual plants, that is one way to get around cold temperatures. But another way that we're very familiar with in the orchard world is losing your leaves during the wintertime, winter deciduousness. So they're, they're losing these uh, leaves that can freeze, and they're uh, basically, uh, they're woody structures, they'll um, go through a bunch of processes to be able to withstand freezing temperatures. So we call this dormancy. <laughs> And there is an official definition for dormancy beyond whether or not a tree that normally loses its leaves, you know, loses its leaves. So there are, um, the official definition of what dormancy is, is whether or not a plant will grow if it's in favorable conditions. And so plants won't grow if they're dormant. So there are actually two phases of dormancy within this. There's what's called endodormancy, which is where conditions within a plant will prevent it from growing. And then there are is ecodormancy, which is when conditions outside of a plant will prevent it from growing. So uh, you can kind of think about, you know, what happens if you take a plant that's dormant and you put it in favorable conditions. So if you do something like take a dormant plant and let's say a tree, let's say we have a growth chamber where we can manipulate temperatures that's big enough to fit this tree. And so you put a tree that's in ecodormancy in this growth chamber. If it doesn't grow or it doesn't grow regularly, it was an endodormancy. If it was an ecodormancy, outside temperatures are preventing it from growing, and so uh, after a little bit of time, it will start growing normally. How we try to quantify this is different, depending on if a plant is an eco or endo and or ecodormancy. If it's an endodormancy, we talk about chill and chill accumulation. If it's an ecodormancy, we talk about heat unit accumulation. So. Trees aren't uh, sitting in the orchards with a thermometer and a calculator, you know, trying to calculate how many, uh, how much chill they're accumulating. This is what we have done to try to describe what plants are growing and how long they need to stay in colder climates or colder conditions before they leaf out and bloom normally. So the way we used to calculate chill here and way the way a lot of people do still calculate chill is what we call chill hours, which are basically the number of hours a plant will spend between 32 and 45 degrees Fahrenheit. And so this was developed in areas where it gets cold and it stays cold. But we don't have that here in California. Our winters can actually be fairly warm, um, especially if you're considering thinking about you know, the Midwest or back east. Um, they don't tend to get 65 degree days in the middle of January. 
Um, and so there have also been times when we've thought that, you know, plants that require a high amount of chill have gotten enough chill, but then they behave as if they haven't. And so what we think is that the old chill model isn't really appropriate for California conditions because it does get warm during the winter time. And it's also quite sunny here. Um, and so if you have ambient temperatures that are kind of close to um, you know, the upper border for when you can get chill accumulation and plant tissues warm up, um, they can actually not be accumulating chill even though a thermometer that you've put in the orchard will say that te uh, temperatures are cold enough for that to happen. Another factor is that we used to get a lot of tule fog. We still get it quite, um, quite often, but um, you know, not as much as we used to. And so uh, we think that the tule fog was probably also reducing sunlight, reaching plant tissues. Um, but you know, this is just uh, uh, you know, us trying to figure out what's been going on. So there have been other models developed for chill. What we are you know, talking about more is the dynamic model. Um, so if you've ever heard chill portions, that's using the dynamic model. And what it basically does is it takes into account warm temperatures, uh, and it also does weighted temperatures based off of, um, you know, if you're, you're closer to freezing or a little bit further away from freezing. So the big thing to understand about the dynamic model is that um, you, the, the tree will basically start, you know, the day, and it'll start accumulating chill as long as temperatures stay favorable. But if it gets too warm, and it hasn't finished accumulating a chill portion, it loses that chill portion for the day. And then it starts off again the next day. But if it stays cool enough, it will basically complete that chill portion. You can do it in half or full chill portions, and it's in the bank. And so it's not gonna lose that. So it will take into account these, these warmer temperatures that we get and possibly sunlight um, hitting trees and warming up plant tissues as well. There we go. Um, this, uh, I will say, uh, work done by Craig Collison, at least for pistachios, is also indicated that chill accumulation may not be the only thing that we should worry about. Um, so I, uh, back in, I think, 2017, um, it's been a while now, uh, Craig Collison modeled pistachio yield against several other factors to try to create a yield model to basically say, you know, try to predict yield. Um, we know that pistachios are alternate bearing, and so if they bear heavily in one year, they're gonna have a lighter yield the following year. So when he put all these factors into his model, he found that, yes, uh, last year's yield is the strongest predictor of current season's yield, because again, they're alternate bearing, but he also found that rather than winter chill, it was warm temperatures during the winter time that were actually a stronger predictor of yield the following season. And in fact, they were a negative predictor. So what he's suggesting is we even think less about chill accumulation, we think more about heat during the winter time. And he'll be the first to say, don't take models literally. If you go and look up his model and use his equation, you know, it's probably not gonna be exactly right, but it's still a useful tool for us to think about how these temperatures might be affecting high chill requiring crops. So um, we do have rest breaking agents available. Um, I'm not really gonna talk a lot about them because, um, well, I'm not a big expert on them, but also, uh, in my opinion, they're a Band-Aid. Um, they can help out in borderline years. They can also help with blue uni uniformity, but they can't help us overcome, or trees overcome insufficient chill. Um, some, like Dormix, are, you know, they're kind of nasty chemicals. <laughs> Um, and so if you're thinking about planting, you know, a pistachio or walnut orchard today in an area that is, you know, starting to lose chill and is predicted to lose a lot in the future, you know, rust breaking agents aren't really going to help you out 40 years down the line from what we understand. Um, they could probably help a pistachio orchard that's in the ground currently and it's uh, uh, dealing with some um, issues in some years, but uh, uh, we need to be thinking about other options for the future. There are other things to worry about other than just dormancy. Um, so I'm gonna use improved French for an example because uh, it's kind of a bloom. Uh, it requires very specific temperatures during bloom. Um, so if you're not familiar with the California prune industry, it's basically dominated by one cultivar and that's improved French. And um, in the past, they uh, or uh, uh, advisors and others in the industry have started to notice that there have been some crop failures during years where there are high temperatures during bloom. 
Um, we know that pollen tube growth in prune is very sensitive. Uh, basically, so when you have pollen that lands on um, the, the stigma, which is the female part, um, it takes time for it to actually grow down and reach the ovule. It can take, um, in almonds, it can take a week or two. Um, I don't know off the top of my head what prunes require, but it's a surprisingly long time. And so pollen tube growth will slow down at temperatures below 71 degrees. They'll also slow down at temperatures above 71 degrees. So it's a really narrow temperature range. And if pollen tube growth is too slow, it's a problem because the ovule is only receptive for a certain period of time. So if you have less than ideal temperatures during bloom, uh, there's a risk of crop failure. So this research was le led by Franz Niederholzer. Um, I monitored an orchard for a couple of years towards the end, um, but I just want to stress that he's the one who's uh, in charge of this project. And he monitored between one and seven orchards between 2005 and 2020, so quite a long time. What we did is we collected temperature during bloom and after. We went through and picked out branches in the orchard, counted flower progression, um, and basically you know, figured out when full bloom was, and we went back later and calculated fruit set. And so uh, Franz threw all this stuff into uh, modeling, and what he found was that um, in order to have a crop failure, you need to have early prune bloom as a prerequisite. If that happens, and you either get sustained cold temperatures or hot temperatures at full bloom or just a couple of days after, um, that was a higher predictor for crop failure. So we know that um, uh, you know, this, the prediction for um, heat waves, because I would say in March, 77 to 81 degrees Fahrenheit is a heat wave. <laughs> um, we know that this is more likely with climate change. And so um, this could potentially be a risk in the future. Um, so not every year that you have this, um, you're not necessarily looking at a crop failure, but you know, if these things are coupled, you know, there's a higher chance of that. It's not all bad news. Uh, some weather risks are going to be reduced, like frosts. So walnuts and pist juvenile pistachios are vulnerable to early frost events. Um, we think that what happens is if they're not pushed into dormancy early enough into the fall, freezing or close to freezing temperatures can damage these tissues. And so, you know, we can try to force them into dormancy, um, but, you know, in pistachios, saline soil has been connected to winter juvenile pistachio dieback, which is the, the long term that's been coined to, to refer to uh, chill damage. Um, and, you know, you can't always, uh, you can't control that. <laughs> but um, we think that uh, these early frost events are going to decrease under climate change. And so, um, you know, frost risk might be reduced in the future. So there are other things you, of course, have to worry about, uh, abnormally dry or wet years. I will say um, I started working for Cooperative Extension in 2017, and we basically swung between really wet or really dry every single year I've been here. Um, and I, we know that uh, that's going to continue. Um, agricultural land can increase in salinity. Um, so with the uh, higher average temperatures during the summertime, that increases water demands for the crop. You're going to have to irrigate more to meet that. And anytime you add irrigation water to soil, you're adding salts, even if you're adding really high quality canal water. And so over time, um, as we're tightening up our, you know, our irrigation efficiencies, which is a good thing, we want to do that, but it's going to reduce in-season leaching. And so you're going to have to think about implement, maybe uh, implementing a leaching plan during the wintertime if you don't normally think about that sort of thing. Um, I also say I don't think that we have a really great idea of how extreme heat affects our orchard crops. A lot of the research um, that's been done, well, in order to do that really well, you have to have a, a growth chamber. <laughs> and um, uh, you, know, you can't stick a full-grown tree in a growth chamber. And so um, you can do a lot of observational work. Um, but you know, we're, we're kind of learning, uh, I think, along with everybody else, uh, how our, our tree crops are dealing with these heat waves. Like, we had in September. Um, so just uh, conclude so that I have some time for questions. Um, so uh, you know, climate change is going to change temperature and weather related risks. Um, some things are probably going to get better. Some things are probably going to get worse. Um, so when we're thinking about uh, species that are growing at the edge of their temperature or chill tolerances, um, that we might have to be shifting them northward where we're going to um, you know, th be thinking about where we're planting future orchards. 
I think there is some space for cultivars that maybe require less chill. Um, we haven't formally quantified this, but we think that Golden Hills and Lost Hills, for example, have a lower chill requirement than Kerman pistachios based on the fact that they bloom earlier. So we think that they, they complete their uh, chill requirement earlier. Um, like I mentioned, I think that rest breaking agents are kind of a band-aid and they're fine for existing orchards, but if you're thinking about the future, I wouldn't rely on these as a, a tool to get around uh, low chill years. And so when you're thinking about future plans, you need to build appropriate risk factors into your, your future orchard and think about you know, how often can you deal with a low chill year resulting in really poor yields. Um, you know, if it doesn't work out, maybe you should be thinking about planting a, a tree species that is, uh, uh, has a lower chill requirement. Um, so, uh, you know, orchard production isn't going away, um, but we are going to have to think about what the future orchard is going to look like, what the future risks are. Um, and uh, something else I I'll like to mention too is that um, with the drought, I visited a couple of almond orchards where folks planted almonds with wells that were too salty and they were relying on surface water. And then when the drought happened and they didn't get any surface water, they started irrigating these trees with water that they shouldn't be irrigating almonds with. So it's not just climate or uh, uh, temperatures. There are other things that you should be thinking about. Um, you know, we're going to have more years of drought ahead of us. And so, you know, think about other things as well uh, when you're thinking about planting your future orchard. You know, what are you going to be irrigating these trees with when you don't have surface water available? Okay. So I can take any questions. Hi. Um, I'll make them quick. So when it comes to chill hours, are there anything, is there any work that's been done on looking on cover on the ground if it impacts the temperatures within the orchard enough to make small differences? I think uh, Greet Brar at Fresno State is interested in looking at that. Um, I, I know I've talked to him about it. I don't know if he's been funded, but um, he's interested in looking at it. Okay, and then you addressed if we can breed our way out of this problem, maybe, maybe not. Um, the pollen tube thing, has that actually been looked at in almonds at all or just in prunes? But they're closely related. They are, yeah. Um, I would, I could ask Tom Gradziel if you give me your contact info. Um, he would be the person I would reach out to for that. And last question, um, on forcing dormancy, you know, back in my dad's day, they used to spray zinc on the trees in the fall to burn off the leaves. Does that help force any dormancy at all? I don't think that question has been fully answered. Um, I will say uh, I have been told to me by an apple researcher that they've looked at that in apples in ooh, South Africa, I think. And they found that if the trees were dormant, so like uh, I think apples can kind of do the same thing that young almonds here can, where they can retain their leaves into December or January, but the trees are dormant. So if the trees were actually dormant, it didn't do anything. And if they weren't, it was actually uh, detrimental. Okay. But that's just one crop that I've heard of. Thank you. Well, we can move on to the next one. Okay. Thanks, Phoebe.